Hey everyone, welcome to Decoding Cryptography, a lecture series where we take a deep dive into the details of encryption and how it shapes our modern day internet. In today's lecture, we're going to prime the pump for the rest of the series by discussing essentially the foundations of encryption and how it relates to our world. So on today's agenda, we have the following subjects. First, we're going to discuss the three most important people in encryption, Alice, Bob, and Eve. We're going to set up that framework and illustrate how Alice, Bob, and Eve are pivotal in the design of modern day encryption systems. Next, we're going to look at the differences between steganography and cryptography. And then after that, we're going to look at two forms of encryption known as transposition and substitution and look at the differences between those two. And then finally, we're going to look at how we break the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, which is our first introduction into cryptanalysis. And so the purpose of this video is the following. As we've discussed before, we want to motivate the idea of cryptography and kind of show why it matters to us. Next, we're going to establish that framework for understanding what does it look like when we try to analyze this cryptographic system. And then finally, we're going to develop some sort of early notions of security and understanding the relationship between a ciphertext and a message. So let's begin with Alice and Bob. Suppose Alice wants to send a message to her friend Bob. Well, Alice could just naively send that message across an open channel from one to the next. However, suppose that Eve is an eavesdropper that's listening on, in on this channel. And Eve can easily intercept this message M, but Alice does not want Eve to know about the message. Well, there are a couple things that Alice can do here to prevent Eve from finding out what the message contents are. First, there's steganography, which the Greek root stands for steganos. It means covered message. This is the art of concealing a message. Next, there's cryptography, whose Greek root kryptos means hidden. And this is the idea of encoding and decoding messages as they travel across a channel between Alice and Bob. Let's take a look at what Alice and Bob's channel looks like if they use cryptography. So Alice still has her message M, which she sends to an encryption algorithm using some shared key K that Bob knows as well. It goes across the channel and is decrypted using that exact same key K. And then Bob receives at the end, finally the message M. Meanwhile, what Eve sees is the following. Eve sees that the message M goes through an encryption algorithm, out pops the ciphertext C, and then back to the decryption algorithm, out pops the final message M. In this setup, which is also known as a symmetric encryption scheme, all Eve sees is the ciphertext C. And that leaves us with the following question. Can Eve learn anything about the message, the original message that is, knowing this ciphertext C. And this is really the overarching goal of when we create a encryption scheme, is we want to make sure that C does not reveal any information about the original message M. And so cryptography can really be broken down into two broad categories. The first is transposition, which is the shifting of positions in the message. The second is substitution, which is actually taking the message and substituting it for some sort of cipher alphabet. And so let's look at transposition. Transposition, as mentioned before, is really just a permutation of the message space into a new arrangement. For example, suppose we have the word cat. Well, cat can be written five other ways. And so this is the power of transposition, is that what Eve receives could be any one of these five different permutations, and she has to unscramble it in order to get the original message. And as you can see, as the message size grows larger and larger, the number of permutations possible increases rapidly. However, this is a bit of a red herring because in truth, Alice and Bob need to have an agreed upon set of rules for doing the transposition. And so really the number of permutations that are possible is quite limited. One of the earliest examples of the use of a transposition cipher was actually done by the Spartans, known as the Cytel, where they take a stick of a fixed width and wrap a cloth around it with their secret message. And the only way that you can unscramble the message 
is by having another stick at the other location with the same width. Otherwise, what you get when you wrap it around a stick is a jumble of letters that's incoherent. Now that we've discussed transposition ciphers, let's move on to the stronger form of encryption known as substitution, in which you replace the contents of the message using a fixed system or, in this case, using letters and alphabet. So for example, if I want to rotate the word cat to the right by 13 places, known as rot13, then what I get is PNG. And so the reason this is strong is because you can use any substitution rule that you want here. I can have, for example, A go to G, C go to L, and Q go to C. If we design the substitution cipher so that each cipher text letter only points to one letter in the plain text space, then what we get is what's called a monoalphabetic substitution cipher, for example, as shown below. Now, if we want to use just letters to create our cipher text alphabet, well, we have 26 factorial, or 4 times 10 to the 26 possible cipher alphabets to that we can create. This is incredibly powerful and daunting if Eve tries to brute force her way through this to determine what the cipher alphabet is. This is the power of the substitution cipher. And so the question you might be asking yourself is how do you break this then? I'll pause the video now if you want to to figure it out for yourself. So here's what we know. We know that languages have rules. And this is going to become incredibly important. We also know that some letters are used more often than others. For example, in the English language, E, T, A, I, O, U are used significantly more than the rest of the letters in the alphabet. This method is known as frequency analysis, and this is going to be how we break the monoalphabetic substitution cipher. So let's take a look at it. Suppose on the left here we have the frequency with which certain letters occur in the English language, and then on the right we have the frequency with which they occur in the ciphertext. If W is the most frequently occurring letter, then you can map it onto E in the plain text space, and say C is the second most frequently occurring letter, then you can probably map it onto T. And if this is correct, then you can start slowly cracking this cipher one by one. Now, there are ways to impede the progress of someone doing frequency analysis. First, you can insert false letters or deceptive characters. For example, every time I write the word Q in my ciphertext, you ignore whatever letter follows that. The second option, which is surprisingly effective, is using what's called homophonic substitution. In this method, what you actually do is you assign the number of ciphertext representations proportional to how frequently that letter occurs. In this example, E gets represented by more numbers than A does because it occurs more often. Now, the problem with this is that it's still able to be cracked, knowing the rules of the English language. Because, say for example, we have the letter Q. Well, what follows Q normally in the English language? The letter U. And this is how frequency analysis can still be used and applied to homophonic substitution cases, and in addition to that, false or deceptive character cases. So just as a recap, here's what we covered today. First, we discussed the notion of Alice and Bob, as well as their friend Eve, the eavesdropper. Next, we looked at steganography versus cryptography, and we took a deep dive more into the idea of cryptography looking at transposition ciphers, as well as the monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Finally, we looked at the method of frequency analysis, which helps us understand how you crack the monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Next lesson, we're going to actually look at the polyalphabetic substitution cipher, which does not suffer from the same flaws that the monoalphabetic substitution cipher uses, and we'll look at how that is the case. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you found it interesting or you think someone else might find it interesting, please share it with them. Um, if you found that the math was a little too lacking, don't worry. Around lecture three and onward, we're going to get very heavy into math and mathematical notation. Until then, uh, my name's Nolan, and this is Decoding Cryptography.